as we continue our week on games, a celebration of our most human pastime, we are very pleased this morning to welcome Scott Simon, host of Weekend Edition on National Public Radio, who has just returned to the United States from an extended, but he will tell you, not long enough stay in France. <clears throat> we, we thank the French for returning Mr. Simon to us for this lecture, and of course on this Independence Day for their support during the American Revolution. Mr. Simon has been with NPR for more than four decades. He started very young. Over the course of his career, he has won every major award in broadcasting, including the Peabody, the Emmy, the Columbia DuPont, the Ohio State Award, the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, and the Sidney Hillman Award. Most recently, he was honored with the 2022 W.M. Kiplinger Distinguished Contributions to Journalism Award. Mr. Su <laughs> Mr. Simon is the author of three books that revolve around America's pastime, baseball, Home and Away, Memoir of a Fan, Jackie Robinson and the Integration of Baseball, and most recently, my pot, no, my Cubs, a love story to honor host Mr. Love story. It is our honor to host Mr. Simon this morning on his first visit to Chautauqua, made possible by our week two presenting sponsors, Highmark, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and AHN Westfield Hospital, and also by the Ethel Paris and Theodore Albert V. Lectureship. This morning's lecture shares its title with our the week's theme, Games, Celebration of Our Most Human Pastime. Please join me in offering a very warm talk welcome to Scott Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here at such a distinguished forum, meet so many nice people. Uh, should I say bonjour? Uh, <laughs> kind of insufferable when someone's, oh, I'm just back from France, so on your trip. <laughs> I'm, I'm my, I've, I've married into a French family. My, uh, my wife is, uh, is, uh, is French. Um, I, I want to begin with some very personal thanks. Uh, is Dr. Elwell here? Some of you may know, if you follow me on Twitter, that I had an unfortunate encounter with a glass shower door. And the glass shower door won. Uh, and so I arrived here cut and bloodied in all different ways. And uh, Dr. Elwell of the Allegheny Health Network, which also made today's appearance possible, helped me yesterday. I, I, I was told he had just been called in from a cocktail party, and I was <laughs> a little concerned about his diagnosis, but it seems to have been all right. Um, and I, uh, I also want, is Emmy, Emma, who was my seatmate on the flight in from Buffalo here? If you're here, Emma, please identify. <laughs> all right. So we're seated next to each other on the flight from Washington, D.C. to Buffalo. She has absolutely no idea who I am and no interest. <laughs> All she knows is that she's trapped 30,000 feet in the air in this tin canister with a man who can't stop showing her pictures of his family, <laughs> including his dog. And then I begin to bleed on her. So, is this the worst person to sit next to on an airplane that you can absolutely imagine? And Emmy, Emma, reached into her purse and brought out a handkerchief and daubed my cuts 
and undoubtedly saved my right arm. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about how sports can come to embody uh, dreams and history and character. And I, I want to begin by relating a story that I really consider myself blessed in all ways uh, to have witnessed. It was at the Kabul soccer stadium. And this was as the Taliban was withdrawing a number of years ago. And on Friday afternoons under the Taliban, the soccer stadium there um, had been the scene of, of executions. Uh, the Taliban had banned sports along with music, theater, movies, all arts as idolatrous. And so this place of joy and celebration and frustration under the Taliban became a killing field and a venue for public torture. Um, all athletes in Kabul, then soccer players, wrestlers, basketball players, um, track athletes, they tried to stay in shape and maintain their playing skills for some day in the future by exercising in secret, in basements, if you can imagine a soccer player trying to exercise and keep their skills up in a basement. Uh, as the Taliban were withdrawing, there was a, uh, they decided to have a, there was a team of British paratroopers, uh, fit, very, very fit uh, British paratroopers that played an Afghanistan team, an Afghan team that was called for the day Kabul United, um, as a way of observing the fact that the Taliban had withdrawn. I've never been at a more emotional sports event, as you can imagine. Kabul United scored the first goal. I've never heard a sound like that in any kind of sports venue. Um, it was both thrilling and chilling. And it's as if that cheer had built up for six years under Taliban rule. They would lose Kabul United three to one, but the first goal reminded many in the crowd that amazing things are possible in life. So there was a British paratrooper who was standing a couple rows in front of us who had long blonde hair, woman, and it was bunched up underneath her paratrooper's beret. And at one point she removed her paratrooper's beret, uh, beret and waved to a friend. The crowd went wild. They had not seen a woman's hair in public for six years. I still get emotional when I think about it. And for the rest of the game, there were Afghan women all over the stadium who would stand up one by one and take off their burqas. I think it's hard for us to imagine. I remember when I went to Afghanistan to cover the war there, my wife said, you've got to bring back a burqa. We can all wear it for Halloween. But when you went there and saw the burqa, you understood there was nothing, nothing comic about it. They were, they were instruments of imprisonment for women. I've never been to a more emotional game. One woman after another shucking off her burqa after six years of imprisonment. And I felt I was blessed to witness such an extraordinary scene, obviously still do. That story never got on the air. Because by the time we got back to file it, the Afghan transportation minister had been assassinated. Uh, I'm afraid the other day I had to look up the man's name, uh, Abdul Rahman. He was 49. Bless him, but not a week goes by I don't remember that soccer game. And I learned a couple of things that I think are especially pertinent for someone who is both a journalist and, and a novelist. The story that seems so urgent and critical today may evaporate into what our friend Salman Rushdie so aptly called the annihilating whirlpool of history. And the story that goes, goes unnoticed today may become the inspiration for a work of art, a family story, an investigation or a life that endures and inspires and instructs. How many Yankees or Dodgers or Giants game of no particular distinction helped inspire and distill the story behind 
Bernard Malibu's great novel, The Natural. I maybe don't need to explain here in Western New York and Bill's country how identification with a sports franchise can be at the heart of, of our own personal identity, civic, regional, and national character. Buffalonians seem to believe that the snow that bites their faces in winter builds the character to be Bills fans <laughs> and the Bills front line. You know, I added that line just in the hope that it would draw applause. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, Mancunians, these are citizens of Manchester, believe that the grit in their surroundings is part of the composition that makes Manchester United so determined on the football ground. Clevelanders. <laughs> who have suffered so much loss by their beloved sports teams. <laughs> found some perfect poetics in the fact that a star from their own firmament of Akron, Ohio, should deliver a world championship to the Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> Quebecois have believed that their winters of blinding ice and sharp winds somehow wound their way into the steel and the, the artistry of the great Montreal Canadian hockey teams in the days when they had to draft locally and the great stars were Henri and Maurice Richard, Guy Lafleur, Jacques Laplante, and Jean Beliveau. Uh, by the way, my wife's, my wife's last name, before we married, is Richard. From the French Richards, I used to refer to her and her younger sister as the rocket and the pocket rocket. <laughs> Found out a few years ago they had no idea why I was doing that. I just assume, all right, that's what he wants to call us. Um, <laughs> Bostonians may believe that some of the special ingenuity that's so entrenched in the history of their city has somehow has enabled the rise of the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> National eminence of Notre Dame football under Newt Rockney in the 20th century. That became a kind of living metaphor for the success of immigrant groups to America. Kansas City is still proud of the stamp and, yeah, the stamp and style and achievement in the teeth of segregation that instilled the Kansas City Monarchs had only one losing season in their 45 years of history and won 10 Negro League championships. The names on those teams' rosters, what an honor roll. Cool Papa Bell, Buck O'Neill, Jackie Robinson, Ernie Banks, and most famously, I think, the, the most brilliant pitcher of all time, and there's no need to say perhaps, Satchel Page. How many women were thrilled and emboldened by the victories of Billie Jean King and then Martina Navratilova and Serena Williams? What did it mean for indigenous Australians in 1971 to see the, trim, uh, the trophy at Wimbledon hoisted aloft by Yvonne Gulligan. <laughs> and then nine years later, she became the first mother to win Wimbledon. And of course, the inspiration, the inspiration Muhammad Ali has been for all time all over the world is in a league of its own. Look, I, I pay attention to sports, uh, despite my longtime affiliation with NPR. Um, <laughs> in, in, in the days before this was freely available on the internet, Morning Edition used to, used to run just a brief 30 seconds of, of scores, uh, principally of baseball games that happened overnight. And I said to the producer once, you know, this was like we were getting into September, and I said, you know, it doesn't make sense to do that alphabetically uh, so that Anaheim is always the first, because when you get into this, you know, this part of the season, you need to say uh, the Yankees won to stay two games ahead of the Red Sox or the Dodgers won to stay three games ahead of the Giants. And she said, oh, Scott, she, she truly laughed in my face and said, oh, Scott, you're the only one who cares about that. I mean, in that small universe of NPR, there, you know, for many years, we, 
gave more coverage of the Iditarod than we did to the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, people often ask me what's the most memorable story you ever covered. I, I actually have an answer for that, which is the siege of Sarajevo in the 1990s. You know, you'd land in a British military aircraft, you'd come down through artillery fire, be loaded into a French Foreign Legion uh, armored personnel carrier. Uh, this was a, a stubby, smelly, windowless crate that I'd call ugly, except it shielded us from sniper fire, so it was quite beautiful. And you could hear the sniper fire pinging against the walls. It was a little bit like steel gnats trying to break in. The Egyptian soldiers would all sing, We all live in the yellow submarine. <laughs> First day I arrived, my engineer and I went through a checkpoint that was burrowed between sandbags, and I was, I was being patted down. I heard a young voice calling out in slangy American English. Hi, my name is Arena. What's yours? Looked up and I saw a dark-haired teenager with short chopped hair wearing an old Soviet army jacket. I said, Scott, where are you from, Scott? I said, Chicago. She said, oh, I love Chicago. Michael Jordan, Chicago Bulls, Playboy, Pizza, Jazz, Scotty Pippen, I love Chicago Bulls. <laughs> and it was an indication to me of what that Bulls team met around the world and that my home, beloved home city, it was no longer Al Capone, it was Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and the Chicago Bulls. It said something about equality in the heart of America. Invention, excellence, resilience, and skyscrapers, all embodied in the tall forms of basketball players. That Bulls team was what we'd now call a very diverse group. They were from all over America, the rural South, urban America, but also Canadians, uh, Bill Wennington. Uh, Tony Kukoc, who fled from the war in Croatia, I had come to Sarajevo to cover. Uh, Luke Longley, still my friend from Australia. Steve Kerr, obviously now uh, coach of the Warriors. <laughs> Steve was born in Lebanon. I think you know his story. His father, the late Dr. Malcolm Kerr, was murdered in a terrorist kidnapping. This was a team that reflected the world and the city that reflected the world. And I think it said to Sarajevans, look what a free and diverse group of people can do if you give them the chance. Uh, did I mention that I had just come back from France? <laughs> Thought I did. Um, I had a... I treated myself to a swelling of French national pride just a few weeks ago. Our family went to the uh, French Embassy in Washington, D.C. to see France's national team play for the World Cup. Um, by the way, I know events in France have been very uh, serious recently. Uh, there has been the, uh, can you refer to it as a tragic crime of a 17-year-old shot at a, at a traffic stop. Um, I need to know more. I, th I think the French nation will, uh, will live with this and I hope deliver its better self. The team on that field that day that we saw, I'm going to read some of the names because for, I think, a lot of Americans, they don't sound what well they're expecting the French names. Theo Hernandez, Ibrahim Konate, Yosef Falana, Kylian Mbappe, Names from all over the world, but born in France in a visible reflection of France's world character and citizenry. Often imperfect and contentious, but a fact. And so we all stood there in the embassy and we sang La Marseillaise. La Marseillaise en fond patrie. By the way, I, I don't recommend paying much attention to the lyrics if you speak French. The uh, Marseille ought to come with a trigger warning. Let us march. May impure blood water our fields. This is not a national anthem that would pass muster today. Um, <laughs> but the song has been through a lot. It's become an anthem of liberty, equality, and fraternity, uh, sometimes despite itself. And I don't mind saying, as a dual citizen by marriage, I began to tear up. 
It reminded me of that scene from Casablanca. Um, and I felt we, if I might use that, became le republic, not despite of our history, but because of it. And because we know what freedom and diversity can embody. The French national team has become a display of France's best qualities, ingenuity, cunning, resolve, and building a French identity for a future that's diverse and dauntless. They did fall short by a goal in the last half, but they came behind so nobly and reflected, I think, some of the glory of the French nation that embraced them. I felt something else in recent years uh, when I reflect on the sparkling 1985 Super Bowl team won by the Chicago Bears. Now this was, the Bears has historically been a team dedicated defense, to defense. The, uh, the greatest defensive player for my mind of all time, number 51, Dick Butkus. Yeah. <laughs> Chicago born, University of Illinois. Forgive me, I think there are children here. Can you beat a football name like Butt Kiss? <laughs> Speaks of steel yards and packing houses. And of course, also on that team, also on their team, historically, number 40, Gale Sayers, the Kansas Comet. Uh, the greatest runner of all time until his running was uh, last cut short by his running. This 1985 team, all due respect to Tom Brady and the Patriots, is still called sometimes perhaps the greatest football team of all time. They glowed. They personified their time and city. The ferocious Mike Singletary at middle linebacker, uh, the greatest all-around running back of his time, Walter Payton, number 34. Um, <sighs> William the Refrigerator Perry human battleship of a blocker. And then Jim McMahon, who was called the Punky QB. Um, he was called the Punky QB, although of course he was a product of Brigham Young University, which is rarely called Punky. <laughs> Jim used to butt heads with his blockers on the front line in a sign of thanks and respect. It was as if to say, you guys take the hits for me. This was the team that sang the Super Bowl shuffle. We are the Bears shuffling crew, coming on down, doing it for you. I, forgive me, I moved. We're so bad, we know we're good. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> but 38 years later, um, I reflect on the team uh, and wince. Jim McMahon lives with early dementia caused by concussion. Walter Payton, who for much of his life, before Barack Obama, was the most famous face of Chicago. He would drive to pharmacies all over the city in various disguises so he could get a fresh prescription for painkillers because the damage to his knees was so sharp and so great. William Perry, God bless him, now lives in a convalescent center. Um, he is stilled from a nerve disease, having suffered through bouts of depression and drinking. He's the largest player ever to score a touchdown in the Super Bowl and uh, now sits in a wheelchair. Dave Dewerson, defensive back, shot himself through the chest in 2011 probably pointedly to permit doctors to examine his brain damaged from concussions. He suffered severe depression and fits of violence for years. Doctors at Boston University examined his brain and concluded indeed he, he suffered from crom, uh, chronic traumatic brain injury. This glittering team has become a kind of historical marker for the wreckage that pro football can wreak on those who play it. And I've got to tell you, it's hard for me to see a game today and not wonder 10, 15 years from now which of the great stars we enjoy today will be harmed and hobbling by playing a game they loved for the enjoyment of all of us. I don't have that ambivalence about following baseball. Uh, let me explain my nominal ties to the Chicago Cubs. My, uh, my godfather, Uncle Jack Brickhouse, 
the team's longtime play-by-play uh, -play announcer. My Auntie Marion, who was a lounge singer, was married to Charlie Grimm, who was the, uh, the team's first baseman and became, she was manager of the 1945 uh, Cub team that got to the World Series. It was the last year of World War II. Charlie was the first to say they were putting guys who couldn't lift a rake into the lineup. Um, Charlie is, is forever enshrined in a Norman Rockwell painting called The Dugout, which, 1948, it shows Cubs sitting in the dugout, Charlie, Uncle Charlie visibly in the middle with a look of pure embarrassment and chagrin on their face at some mortifying play that's going on on the field. Um, and so over the years, I've become regarded as a kind of unofficial club laureate, uh, to quote the Tribune. Um, I get asked to throw out the first pitch at Wrigley Field occasionally. Let me tell you about the time I did it in 2016, when the Cubs won the World Series, after 108 years of losses. This was July 31st. Okay, the Cubs were in first place in the Central Division, six and a half games ahead of the <coughs> St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry, is there anybody here from St. Louis? I, there is, I respect the Cardinals greatly, all right? Stan Musial, Bob Gibson, they're great. Actually, I met Bob Gibson once. Uh, we had dinner together and he had been, he had, with a group of people, he had been briefed and he said, oh, you're the Cub fan. And all throughout the dinner, I would look over at him and say, oh, Mr. Gibson, please just throw a dinner roll at my head, would you? <laughs> he, was, he was known for uh, brushback pitches. But in any event, so the Cubs asked me, what, what number would you like to, to wear? And I said, number 34. It, of course, was the number one by Walter Payton of the Bears, who died too young. It was the, the number worn by Kerry Wood, who struck out 20 in his fifth career start and then struggled for the rest of his career with arm trouble. I liked the history of number 34. So the Cubs were playing the Seattle Mariners that night. Um, my family has a hard time when we go to Cub games because I absolutely brim in my heart and I start, I used to say, oh, I'd meet Uncle Jack over there. Santa would do his dance down that baseline. Oh, that's for Steve Bartman, you know what he did, hey. Well, you once sat up there, Uncle Charlie played there, Aunt Marion dribbled his ashes down. The game nights can be very long for my family, let's just put it that way. Now, I had, I had rehearsed my throw with a yoga instructor. I, I mean, look, I'm trying to be modern. Uh, who, uh, who said the key was in my psoas. Pardon my Latin, I'm still not altogether sure where that is, but in any event, I, I ginned up my so as, uh, my, my throw is not worth recalling. Let's just say it would have been called too high on even LeBron James. Um, <laughs> but the, the game turned out to be a mile post for 2016. The Cubs fell behind six to nothing. Uh, Joe Madden, then the manager, uh, brought in seven pitchers. I like to think I would have been the eighth. But the Cubs came from behind, they caught up. The game went into extra innings, and as the clock on the scoreboard rotated toward midnight, at the bottom of the 12th inning, Jason Hayward hit a double, moved up to third, and Joe Madden called in a pitcher to pinch hit, John Lester. Anyone know his number? 34! Now look, he, he became, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball, but when he walked to the plate that night, his career batting average was .051. <laughs> Seattle pulled in their players, expecting to bunk. Um, that night, with the winning run on his toes, 90 feet from home and down to two strikes, John Lester punched a short, solid, dead bird of a bunk that rolled to a stop about six feet from home plate. <laughs> Yard or so from the first baseline, the Seattle catcher lunged forward to try and grab the ball with his bare hand, and he leaned back, stretching his psoas, <laughs> to try and reach for a tag on Jason Hayward. 
But Jason Hayward snuck in his toes before he could touch home plate. It was a great Seattle defensive play, and it missed by an inch. Just before midnight, the calendar would flip to August, and Cub fans worried about any lead wilting in the swelter, but not that year. There were the white wind flags flapping in the stands like birds taking off in a flock, choruses of people singing, Go Cubs, Go. Uh, a pitcher and a catcher had snatched outs from hits in the vines and in the grass, and a pitcher had pinch hit the winning run with a bunt in the dirt. That is so cub-like. <laughs> and of course, another notch in history for number 34. So that game would begin a 13-game winning streak. The Cubs would extend their lead in the National League Central Division. Uh, however, my own contribution to history is uh, lost in the annihilating whirlpool of history. By the way, I have friends here from Cleveland. And the Cubs played the Cleveland Indians, they were then called, in the 2016 World Series. Um, I wish it had been almost any other team. Uh, during the year of my childhood, my father was field announcer for the tribe. And no member of our family will ever get greater public acclaim in response to anything they said than when my father would say, Batting in the fourth position, number seven, the right fielder, Rocco Rocky Calavito. <laughs> I could... That summer was the greatest of, of my young life. Uh, it was the last year, by the way, my parents were married. I went to the ballpark with my father almost every day. I had a hot dog for lunch. Nobody thought there was anything wrong in that. Um, <laughs> And I got to go into the locker room and see boyhood idols in their jock straps, <laughs> which is not, by the way, always recommended to maintain your idolatry. But in any event, um, <laughs> our, our family still feels a powerful connection to Cleveland. Uh, it has much of the character that we love about Chicago, a city of hardworking people who have too often just come within a wink in their eye of, of success and just everything that can be said about the prolonged drought for the Cubs winning the World Series can be said about Cleveland, uh, just minus 40 years. Um, we know what a World Series would mean to the city, and we want nothing but the best for Cleveland. Um, look, for all the resonance that sports can bring into our lives, uh, I, I shrink from imputing them with too much historical significance. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being the toy department of, of modern life. There is a hallowed exception, which I want to note on this 4th of July in U.S. history. And that's Jackie Robinson's integration of baseball in 1947. <laughs> Jackie Robinson was signed as the war was ending in 1945. The memory of this is particularly strong coming back from Normandy. 420,000 Americans died to defeat a fascist, racist, supremacist Axis empire. But the army that did that was segregated. Segregation was still the law of this land in the states of the old Confederacy. A few notes of the Jackie Robinson story I'm going to share today might be less familiar. When I wrote my book, I discovered that the movement to integrate Major League Baseball had actually grown widespread by the 1930s. It ranged from all the way on the left to the Communist Party of America, and by the way, the Communist Party newspaper, The Daily Worker, had a pretty good sports section. <laughs> um, to Westbrook Pedler, who was a right-wing, isolationist, Roosevelt-hating, lynch mob-defending columnist, who nevertheless wrote in a column, quote, how can we call baseball our national pastime when the major leagues are closed to Negro athletes who have shown they can play the game so superbly? 
Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who signed Jackie Robinson, was called the Mahatma.、Um, and he had some strong principles, but he was more Barnum than Gandhi. He wanted to beat the damn Yankees. And he was willing to search for talent in places that Major League Baseball had not scoured because of segregation. He looked in the Mexican leagues. He looked in the Negro leagues. I'm actually working on a novel now after discovering the Dodgers had tryouts for players who were in Japanese American internment camps. Baseball had been very popular. And was very popular in the camps during the war. Mr. Rickey said, "The fact that these boys are American boys is good enough for the Brooklyn club." And I think one of one of the overlooked aspects of his stories is that、uh, by 1949, Hiro Nakamura and Hank Matsubi were playing for the Modesto Reds,、um, minor league affiliate of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now, over the years, I think the question's been raised: Why was Jackie Robinson signed? Alone to break the color barrier in Major League Baseball, because within a month of his debut, the Cleveland Indians and the St. Louis Browns would sign black players. The great Larry Doby、uh, was signed by Cleveland, who was on on the club when my father was the field announcer.、Um, Within、uh, the next year, great black stars including Monty Irvin, Satchel Paige, Don Newcomb, Roy Campanella, Willie Mays. And many more would come into Major League Baseball. Why weren't they all signed at the same time? Why was the burden of breaking a barrier of hate put on Jackie Robinson's broad shoulders alone? Branch Rickey was not a reformer or revolutionary. He was principled and diligent and devoted. But most of all, he was a showman. He knew that the drama of a lone man staring down bigots, walking tall and determined in the face of hatred, would not only break barriers in baseball but give human form to bravery—an image that persists to our time. Jackie Robinson, for his part, was not Mahatma Gandhi in cleats. He was a jock. He might have been the best all-around athlete of his time. Baseball wasn't even his best sport. He was a great collegiate track star in California. He was a great shooting guard in baseball. He might have won a collegiate golf championship, except, of course, the courses of the time were segregated. But he knew how important his story had become to so many millions, and he became an activist after his playing days. When he joined civil rights demonstrators on marches, they would often call out to him, "Show us, Jackie." He sure did. I want to share, if it's all right with you, three major concerns I have for those of us who love and follow sports these days. First, I touched a bit on this before: is the wreckage, the human toll of concussions and other injuries we now know that can be inflicted in football, in boxing, in hockey, in so-called mixed martial arts sports. Like cage fighting, and I share the late Senator John McCain's disdain and refuse to even call call cage fighting a sport. We now know, and we can follow, the damage these sports can inflict on participants, and of course families and others.、Uh, it seems to me we're obliged to change the rules, even at the risk of making the sport less dramatic. I did a series a number of years ago on brain damage in boxing. Totally changed my view of that enterprise.、Uh, the evidence is overwhelming. The late champion Floyd Patterson, who I liked a lot, talked about the fallacy somehow that headgear、uh, would make concussion less common in boxing. Not true at all. It, it reduces facial cuts, which of course boxers want before a match, but it puts even more weight on the head.、Uh, forgive me for being so graphic, but it makes a head that is, is struck even heavier, and the brain pan sloshes around, and that is what causes concussion damage. Same, by the way, with helmets in football, which have now become converted into head-ramming weaponry.、Um, Boxing is not as popular as it used to be in this country. I wonder how many. Does anybody here know the name of the current heavyweight champion of the world? 
No, but you're in the same nationality, Daniel Dubois of Britain. Uh, I had to look it up. 19 wins, one loss, 18 knockouts. I have made it my personal and professional vow that every time I interview a boxer, which I haven't done since Floyd Mayweather, to ask, have you thought about the damage you risk? And when I've asked that of boxers, they say, this is who I am. This is what I do. But I think of how tragic it was to see Muhammad Ali, once so sparkling, dancing and rhyming, silent and shaking. Joe Frazier, Ken Norton, so many more, dazed and doddering in their 40s. I don't believe the prohibition of boxing is wise or feasible, but maybe shorter rounds, and maybe most controversially, no shots to the head. But you wonder, would anyone pay to see that kind of boxing? It would be a test for fans. The second danger that concerns me is the way legalized gambling has come into all games. Um, you, know, you know, one of the premises of opening the door uh, to the salaries of top-level professional players has now become extraordinary. One of the ideas of increasing uh, the salaries so much is that nobody would have a motive to throw a game or even a bad pitch or to miss a shot on purpose. Uh, and I'm not reassured by this. For one thing, I invite you to review history, and not just sports history, but finance, politics, industry, monarchy. And you tell me if you're satisfied that people of wealth and means have no motive to steal. <laughs> uh, there's some feeling they wouldn't jeopardize their careers by throwing games and losing intentionally, but some of the biggest scandals in sports have been not throwing games, but shaving points. I'm talking about the CCNY point shaving scandal in 1950 and 51. Uh, the Boston College basketball point shaving scandal of 1978 and 79. These are players who were playing to win, but missing a shot to bring down the margin of victory to benefit a bet. Uh, I had a boyhood friend, Billy Levitt, no longer with us, who became a financial consultant for um, athletes. He once played poker with Michael Jordan, which he said he wouldn't recommend to a casual poker player, but um, he as he was leaving that, I guess they played all night in a hotel room in downtown Chicago, and as he was leaving, he said, I really need an autograph picture, picture. And Michael Jordan said, you know, I don't walk around with pictures to autograph. And Billy turned around and he saw the, you know, the city magazine they put in hotel suites, and of course there was a picture of Michael Jordan, so he ripped it out, and Michael Jordan signed it. Billy and I were talking once, and, and there had been a report that Michael Jordan had I believe lost $110,000 on a golf game. And I said, well, I, you know, he's a rich man. I guess he can lose it. And Billy said, I don't care how rich you are. You lose $110,000 on a golf game, you've got a problem. And Billy explained to me that big-time athletes are their own corporations, and they have to account for every check they write. Uh, to their family, to their financial managers. And uh, <laughs> should I say, who? Who let the dog out? <laughs> I, I'm, all right. And yes, I'm going to talk about the important position of canines in sports. Just give me a moment. <laughs> so, does legalized gambling in sports encourage owners and general managers and coaches not to try to improve their team's performance if through legalized gambling they can make as much or more money just by finishing in the middle of the pack? And my last concern touches on ownership, but in a different way. Should fans feel implicated by the ownership of the clubs for which they cheer? 
Now, there's sometimes people who contact me and, he, and say, how can you root for the Cubs given the politics of the family that owns it? I will explain. Joe Ricketts, the founder, is an active political conservative, as is his oldest son, Pete, who is now junior senator from Nebraska. Their younger sister, Laura, is a noted gay political activist and liberal Democrat. Their brother, Tom Ricketts, the controlling partner, describes himself as middle of the road. And Tom said to me once, we have some differences and we love each other. In other words, we're a family, so what? And I find this compelling. But I think a substantially different question is raised today when the ruling powers of authoritarian governments, with blood on their hands, begin to buy positions in international sports. I think of the Olympics in Sochi, Russia, and Beijing. I think of the World Cup in Qatar. I think of the International Golf Tour, now essentially bought by the Saudi royal family. The current term for this, of course, is sports washing. Um, and it's using sports to make an oppressive totalitarian regime seem as if they believe in rules, fair play, and freedom to participate. Now, we sometimes hear it said, this is engagement. It can introduce them, introduce them to leavening and democratic forces. But I think we've reached the point in our history and in practical experience where we can ask, did holding the 1936 Olympics in Berlin deter the crimes and ambitions of the Nazis? Has holding the Olympics in Beijing in recent years opened up that society to liberty and led the government to end the imprisonment of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities? Did holding the Winter Olympics in Sochi deter Vladimir Putin's engorgement of Crimea and invasion of Ukraine? Did holding the World Cup in Qatar induce that government to reduce the oppression of foreign workers? We, we could go on. And of course, in recent years, the International Olympic Committee and FIFA have been caught up in bribery scandals. Um, there has been a depressing tendency to locate major sporting events in authoritarian regimes, because those regimes will spend money freely, throw it around, and not ask too many questions. Does that leave those of us who are sports fans to try and do some of the moral calculations that sports executives, owners, and leaders seem to want to avoid. Look, I admire LeBron James on the court and off the court and what he's done for Cleveland. But I do not agree with his stated conviction that the human rights policies of China, a state in which he reportedly earns a lot of money from endorsement deals, is none of his concern nor the concern of any other pro athlete. Of course, LeBron can just flick my concern aside like a bad shot at the hoop. Um, in the future, will we fans find it increasingly difficult to cheer the performances of athletes we admire and enjoy and at whom we marvel because we know that the cost of putting their talents on stage for us to enjoy has been to enrich a dictatorship? or try and disguise and distract us from the crimes of a totalitarian state? I do not have an all-purpose answer, but I believe we have to question our own responsibilities. I don't want the future of sports to be left-wing and right-wing teams, Democratic, Republican, liberal, or conservative teams, teams that themselves embody the strength and diversity and reaching across divisions. That's what I think we want. And I think the strength and appeal of sports can be especially strong today as we live in times of stark divisions between people of all backgrounds and beliefs. Sports can be something different. It can be a source of unity in a divided world. When we cheer for a team we love despite setbacks, a star that thrills us, a performance we admire, we cheer in a chorus of voices that can unite us in a song of celebration. Years ago, I went down to Comiskey Park on the south side of Chicago. Now guaranteed right there. Yes, south side of Chicago. It was following a baseball strike. 
and they were coming back, I forget how many games were missed. And there were a group of kids who the uh, groundskeepers used to look the other way and let them in to watch batting practice. And I began to talk to the group of kids, asking them what they were doing during the summer if they couldn't sneak into the baseball park. You know, and they talked about the depressing things they were doing, like studying, <laughs> spending time with their parents. <laughs> so, working for NPR, I of course said, but have it, has it the, strike, the strike demonstrated to you that you can live without baseball? And one of the young boys said to me, yeah, but I don't want to. My name is Scott Simon, and I endorse this message. <laughs> Thank you. We have questions now, right? We do. Okay. And I get to ask the first one. Yes. <laughs> you ended where I was actually going to begin. As you were speaking, I was thinking about the miracle on ice back um. in 1980 and whether or not you thought that a moment like that somehow or another could still have the unifying force that that victory did have uh, 20, 43 years ago, and, uh, whether that's still possible in this Yes, I, I mean, I, I, the, the circumstances I think would be different. I, I actually, I was covering that Olympics, and I remember I was going, I was coming back, I was covering the Olympics in Lake Placid, and I was called away to cover the Canadian federal elections, and I was coming back through the border, and that game, what we now call the Miracle on Ice, was, um, was on television. And God bless them, the Canadian and American border guard said, nobody's getting through or watching this game. <laughs> and we all agreed. It was just, it was just, it was, it was absolutely terrific. And I, but I, I yeah, it, it was, it, it was wonderful to see. Good movie, by the way. <laughs> uh, and uh, may I, forgive me, I sometimes go into a speech before we, uh, all right, before our, before our show goes on the air Saturday mornings, we have what we call the page. I get on the internal paging system and I go, it's a beautiful day for a radio show. Let's do two today and a podcast. <laughs> which derives from Ernie Banks during the worst of the Cubs years saying, it's a beautiful day for a ball game, let's play two today. And I sometimes walk around between the desks of our editors and producers who were trying to work, and I, I, I borrow freely from the speech given in the miracle of on ice. And I say, okay, maybe we're not always as good as all things considered or morning edition. <laughs> But Saturday morning, this is our time. <laughs> I, I, uh, it, it's not a good Kurt Russell, and everybody goes, ah, thank you, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, I promise, given our discussion backstage, that I did not write this question, that it exists. Uh, what? No call out to Pittsburgh teams? 1979 City of Champions, Steelers, Pirates, Penguins, the Immaculate Reception, the great Roberto Clemente. This, sh this Chautauquan is myth. <laughs> I, I agree with all of that. I, one of my big moments in history was interviewing Mario Lemieux. Um, which, by the way, do you know how Mario Lemieux, of course, 
Uh, uh, he would be up there with the greatest Pittsburgh athlete of all time, along with Clemente, yeah. Franco Harris. Yes. All right. Um, well, I interview. I got to interview uh, Mario Lemieux. Do you know how he learned hockey? His mother, in the middle of, of uh, a Montreal winter, would would turn a garden hose on the entrance to their apartment building where they picked up the mail, and he and his brothers would skate there. I love that story. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I, I love, and as, and as you know, um, I loved Roberto Clemente. I think one of the most important figures ever in sports. And I don't know how to explain this. I went, I went, went to bed on a New Year's Eve. There was no radio on. I was a student then, and I, I dreamt during the night that Roberto Clemente had left us, which turned out to be the case. He died in a plane crash that New Year's a Nicaraguan earthquake relief, as I recall. Mm -hmm. He was going there. Uh, he was one of the great, great stars ever, and certainly the greatest, the greatest throw from right field that you will ever see. So true. As a lifelong Bills fan, I often wonder what it will feel like to reach the mountaintop. <laughs> could, could you describe your personal experience of October and November 2016? Did your fandom of the Cubbies change afterward? Well, no, but it's generational. Uh, our children are 16 and 20, and they, they just don't understand the whole idea of the Cubs being losers because they've, they've been, until recently, a fairly plausible major league franchise for, for much of their conscious life. I mean, I, look, I, I, will, uh, I went to the three games uh, in Chicago, uh, and I have friends in Cleveland who uh, offered to make it possible for me to go to the seventh game. And for one thing, as I, as I recall, it was a Thursday, and I, 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 I had to get back. I had to get back to work. My wife and I also talked about the fact that if I went and the Cubs lost, I would forever blame myself, <laughs> and would never be able to enjoy another Cubs game. So. I mean, you remember that it was the rain delay, the 20 minutes, apparently, the inspiring speech in the locker room. And my wife and I had sent our children to bed because, as my wife said, darling, if the Cubs lose, I don't want them growing up with a complex. Um, <laughs> and, of course, they won, and I began to sob like a baby. And I went in to wake up our oldest daughter, and I said, baby, baby, the Cubs won. And she said, oh, I knew they would. <laughs> like it was no big thing. <laughs> a couple of questions asking for your thoughts on name, image, and likeness and its Im impact on college sports. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Name, the... image, and likeness and the fact that... Oh college students can get paid? You know, I, 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 yeah, usually not thinking about something in advance doesn't, uh, or not being able to provide a thoughtful reply doesn't prevent me from answering a question. But in any event, <laughs> um, I haven't thought about that enough. I mean, I do, I do think it, it, it's only right for athletes to benefit from the, you know, from the, uh, from any commercial use that's made of their imagery. But uh, I, I can see where this has to be thought through very carefully, and there's a, yeah, and there's a, um, you know, there's a, there's a sacrifice for losing amateurism too. Will America ever become a soccer power? Well, I, I think American women would say we already are a soccer power. <laughs> I don't know if the men will ever catch up. Um, <laughs> men, you know, they're worried what's going to happen to their nails. Um, <laughs> they, uh, you know, does my hair look all right? Um, oh, I don't want to get all sweaty on the field. You know, I'm not sure men uh, will have the wherewithal to catch up. But no, I shouldn't say that. Uh, there's no reason why the American men shouldn't obviously catch up. 
Would Muhammad Ali be Ali without boxing? And what is the alternative for most who come from an uh, underprivileged background? You know, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure he would. Uh, I, uh, I remember when he came to Wrigley Field years ago um, and took batting practice. And uh, he wasn't even as good as Michael Jordan. Um, <laughs> and, and unlike Michael Jordan, he hadn't grown up with any, any, you know, enjoying any kind of other sport at that particular point. I'm not sure he would. And, I'm not, and I think for, uh, for young boxers, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure there's, uh, I'm not sure they can cross over into another sport. I, 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 don't, I don't want to prohibit boxing. I don't think that's practical. Uh, but the wreckage is just extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary, and I think that's something we have to uh, we have to think through um, because uh, it's um, the the uh, the damage is cumulative. It might be the kind of thing that you can do for a few years in your in your youth, but uh, past the teenage years and early twenties, I don't know. There, Looks like there it went. No, no, I lost the You may not want to read that one. No, no. no. Uh, we're trying to give every city in the East. Oh, right. East Sorry. Let's do. Why does the lone Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl, Bowl victory five years ago still feel so good and their losses won and 43 years ago still sting? Well, I'd have to be more of a Philadelphian to know that. We have, uh, you know, we have friends in Philadelphia. We think it's a great city. Um, I, I know the story about them booing Santa Claus is greatly overdone. Uh, they didn't, what was it? They threw snowballs at Santa Claus, right? They didn't boo, it was just an inviting target. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I happen to think that, um, uh, I, it, it, the Phillies are one of those franchises where I, I, I think we can fairly say that the identity with the, between the city and the franchise, be it the Eagles, uh, be it the Phillies, is one of those things that's very, at the, very much at the heart of, of civic identity. And therefore, that's something as a north side Chicago, and I feel very, very deeply uh, myself. And uh, we've... Um, We've always had a good time when we've been to Philadelphia. Sorry. <laughs> Namby-pamby, enough of an answer. <laughs> it, you can tell that I interview politicians, can't you? <laughs> I think Philadelphia is a great American city, and I love their sports teams. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. How do you feel about Jim Brown, and where does he sit on your list of great athletes well he was a an absolutely great running back uh, he died on our watch uh, I think he died on a Thursday night and uh, we obviously had to talk about his uh, his career on uh, on Saturday morning um, he had a great career as a running back he had a great career in many ways as a political and social activist um, he, I look. I have to be blunt about it. His 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 history with women was uh, was ugly. Uh, he was uh, he was oppressive and violent, and uh, I, I don't think there's anything that can be said that uh, that justifies that. Um, and um, therefore, the legacy is uh, is mixed. This wasn't just somebody who was a uh, you know, a bad or unfaithful husband, but somebody who was a, um, a violent partner. And I, I don't think we can have any, uh, I don't think we can have any patience for that. May, may I tell a story about mm -hmm. his partner who was in the, uh, in the backfield with him there? In sure, the Cleveland Browns? absolutely. Bobby Mitchell, and he later became, I believe, general manager of the club then known as the Washington Redskins. And he was, he was a, a very good halfback, Bobby Mitchell. And forgive me, are there children here? Because I'm going to use some bad language. Um, I was on the same flight, a small regional jet with Bobby Mitchell, 
who, who had, by the way, hand-tooled leather luggage that had his name on it, so there was no missing him. <laughs> and my, my father had also been the field announcer for that one year for the Cleveland Browns. And I went up to him and said, <laughs> uh, Bobby, oh, Mr. Mitchell, I remember you as a kid in Cleveland. And Bobby Mitchell said, oh, you remember me as a kid? And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Mitchell. And he said, well, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a small regional jet. So, I mean, like I was in the third row and he was in the last row, but his legs stretched all the way to the third row. <laughs> And I was in a state of fear the entire flight. Uh, he, I mean, he said it with a smile, but in any event, I, so I, I prefer to think of that member of the backfield. <laughs> What's your favorite sports movie? I can't mention two, can I? No, all right. Uh, I have friends from Cleveland here. I happen to love Major League. Um, which, of course, is, uh, is set in Cleveland. Uh, parts of it might be a little bit dated every now and then, let's put it that way, but uh, it's, it, it, it has raunchy humor. You will never see a better crowd scene than when Charlie Sheen, playing the uh, relief pitcher known as the Wild Thing, comes in and the entire crowd begins to sing Wild Thing. It's just a wonderful scene. By the way, shot in Milwaukee, of all, of, of all places, but the crowd scene is absolutely wonderful, and, uh, and I love that. I, I, you know, I also, I also carry the torch for Bull Durham. Uh, I also like Hoosiers, which is a great basketball movie starring, uh, you know, starring Gina. I mean, I could, I could go on. On the flight coming back from, I don't know if I mentioned that I was just in <laughs> France, but uh, on the flight coming back from France, I actually watched Tin Cup, <laughs> uh, which is very funny if you, get a, if, you, if you get a chance to watch it. It's another Kevin Cos uh, Ron Shelton, who also made uh, Bull Durham, a former minor league ball player, also made Tin Cup. With the incredibly rising cost of ticket prices, how will those who cannot afford to attend become connected to their teams? I worry about this, and so is my seatmate Emma still up there? <laughs> uh, this was actually something that we talked about in between me showing pictures of our children uh, <laughs> and our dog. Uh, I worry about that, absolutely worry about that because I, uh, you know, the, the amount that, of money that you'd have to spend for a family of four is just, uh, has just skyrocketed. And of course, they, they can get it. That's why they charge those ticket prices. But I think we have to, we have to worry about what kind of audience is, uh, is being cultivated for the future. Because, you know, watching it on the screen is just not enough for a fan base. I think you also need the in-person experience, and I think that's particularly important in sports. We'll close with this one. You always bring humor to your broadcasts. In the face of news that is seldom funny, why is that important? Well, some weeks you can't, you just can't do it. Uh, you know, I, uh, I can remember weeks of particularly paralyzing bad news, sad and tragic news. I'm thinking of the days following 9-11. We made no particular attempt to, to bring anything even remotely humorous in, into, the, into the broadcast. But I think week to week, um, I like to think of it in terms of having a relationship with the audience and everybody who's listening. And it can't just be one note. Um, I mean, we could, we could fill a two-hour show, we could fill a six-hour show every week with stories that are urgent and important and necessary for people to know. I'm not sure how many people would listen, how many people would have the patience for it. I think you also need to include music. You need to include humor. You need to include uh, the arts. You need to include reflections. You need to, uh, you need to include 
pieces that provoke gentle humor and sometimes exclamation points. I think you have to have a whole relationship with your audience. And if you have that by the time you have a very important story, um, you hope that people will be with you uh, because you would have brought them a little bit more along on a journey. Uh, but yes, it's something that we worry about from week to week, trying to keep that balance. But I think it's, it's in many ways even more important in dark and dire times to have a note of humor, to have a note of lightness, uh, to remind ourselves that uh, there's nothing more beautiful in the music of human emotions than laughter. Well, you have a relationship with this audience. We thank you. And uh, we're very grateful for your participation today. Thank you. CHQ Assembly is made possible through the collaboration and innovation of Chautauqua Institution's full-time and part-time staff, seasonal staff, and many volunteers, as well as participants like you, whose engagement, gifts, and subscriptions sustain our mission.